So we'll get started. Um, I just am going to ask everyone to quickly introduce themselves um, with a little nugget about why they're here and um, what they do and what their mission in life might be. And Lisa? There you go. I'm going <laughs> um, hi, my name is Lisa Raja. Um, I am the mother of two boys, 10 and 12. Um, I've had anything but a linear career path, uh, very windy. My background for the most part is in fashion. Um, and right now I run a collaborative workspace for moms. Um, and I quite often get asked why moms over women in general and all women are welcome in my space. But I personally feel that working moms are tasked with the most difficult job in that you come to work and the expectations as far as your income and career growth is astronomical and you put the same pressures on yourself as anyone else would, but then you come home and you run Uber for your kids and there's dinner and dry cleaning and your in-laws and your parents and blah, 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 and mood swings and emotions and you manage all that and likely go back to your first job around 10 or 11 and then repeat. And <clears throat> where there's so many conversations to women um, in the stroller years where it's about nipple cream or something that blinks or glows for your kid, um, conversations to us after your kids become stable seem to just nosedive. And I feel like at the place that I'm at now, I'm actually in my prime, both mentally and career wise, and I'm ready to guess. But there's not much as far as tools or resources because we've changed. I mean, giving birth causes a, a beautiful amount of change. There's some not so beautiful parts of it. There's some self doubt, some insecurities, and navigating back is a bit tricky. So the space is obviously uh, co working in that, or collaborative, I like to call it. Um, for women who are already in business and need the bells and whistles of beautiful space and conference rooms. But bigger than that is the conversations via events, which we do in tandem with Mom Warrior that are geared to help them make the transitions that they want. So for those like me who stepped away for some time to raise kids, and now it's six, eight years have passed, you're trying to get back in, you still have 15 years under your belt, you're still educated and smart and tenured, but coming back in, it's not, it's not the game has changed. And how do you make that transition? Or you were trained as an architect and now you want to be a nutritionist. How do you come from A to B with no experience, but you've changed. Um, so we offer programming really geared to help her find her way. So through mentorship, through conversations around um, marketing, social media, branding into bigger topics like around self-care, whether that's the benefits of cannabis, sex in your marriage, um, meditation, beauty, and what that means as far as feeling good, all, all of that. So she's mentally whole in addition to the career part of it. So that's my mission right now. Um, I'm uh, to what Desiree was saying. Can't, I'm not, look, I can't change the world overnight, but I'm just whatever my small contribution can be. I live in Oakland. I'm tied and true to the women there. Um, I just closed an online site called Trade Moms. It was basically... Um, Angie's list for moms and it allowed moms to post, you know, I'm an architect, I'm a lawyer, I'm a this, and for them to be able to connect. My problem there was, is I am more a tangible type of person and I want to see connection and saying empowerment and community wasn't happening online. And so I closed to re sort of rebrand in a off in this offline business where I can actually see that connection happening. So today I met someone who's a social media strategist. I knew who I should think, link her up with. Meanwhile, she could work here. Meanwhile, she can come and learn about whatever she needs to push her business forward. So here is where I'm building community and here's where I'm empowering. And, and we're at all steps of insecurities and triumphs and killing it and starting and everything in between. So anyway, sorry, I blabbed. <laughs> your turn. Oh, you've got one. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm nowhere near that badass. Um, <laughs> uh, my name's Dan Stevens. Um, I'm a content design manager here at Atlassian. Um, and I'm here because uh, I was a single parent um, and I raised three uh, kids with intellectual challenges um, on my own while I went to school and worked full time. Um, that's pretty badass. And <laughs> that's, that's badass. <laughs> and, um, and during that process, I learned a lot. Um, as uh, my career grew, I became uh, 
more of a leader. Um, and <clears throat> excuse me, as a part of my leadership, uh, one of the things I do is I mentor all people, um, obviously, but uh, I do focus on single parents and parents and people with children because it is significantly more challenging to um, aggressively pursue a, a career when you also have to raise children and you're trying to do that balance. And um, some of my experiences were uh, not going to go on poster boards. Uh, my kids were often latchkey, and so I, I try and help people find daycare so that they don't have to go through some of the same things that they went through. I'm more attentive to um, the different needs that we have, especially around time. And and the other thing, though, that the other thing that I try and really uh, focus in on is if you're ambitious and you're also a parent, that can often be one of the biggest crossroad challenges. Like, I really want to be successful and I really want to do this awesome stuff and I really, you know, but I can't be here 70 hours a week. And I, you know, um, and so finding ways to help people like spark their joy, <laughs> spark their joy and spark their skills and, uh, and set fire to, um, you know, their career path. That's been my focus for a long time. Um, I'm also involved in a whole lot of other organizations. Um, I've been a member of Habitat for Humanity for ages, um, been an activist with Planned Parenthood for about 20 years, um, and I've done uh, a lot of writing for them. Um, and mostly, though, I just try and be thoughtful um, and helpful and available to um, all the parents and all the people who need mentorship. Oh man, in trouble. Uh, my name is Ambalika Suthan. I'm a customer success director at a startup in Sunnyvale called Turvo. Uh, the reason I'm here, <laughs> this is going to sound terrible, like super selfish, uh, but no, but this is really what inspired me to think about women's issues and to think about uh, feminism and things like that. Um, early on in my career, I worked on the trading floor at a large investment bank where I don't feel like uh, I thought about feminism much, to be honest with you. It was early in my career. I wouldn't say the ratio is 50-50, but I think a barrage of lawsuits in the 90s meant, you know, the investment banking industry had really made some true efforts to, to make the environment more hospitable across the board. Uh, I did a couple of years of that, and then I moved out to the Bay Area. I worked at a startup that was probably the utopia of the most diverse company in every dimension uh, you could imagine. And I had been there for several years when I, you know, I decided to have my first child and, uh, you know, I got pregnant, pretty uneventful pregnancy. Um, postpartum, I could have a separate talk just about the postpartum experience, but that's not the topic for today. And, uh, you know, I came back to, to work and I was, I was managing like the work life thing, you know, uh, working mom thing as best I could. And, and things were going pretty well, right? And uh, I was actually up for a pretty big promotion. Like I had to interview with the CEO. It would, it would be an increase in responsibilities, a pretty significant pay increase. And I got the promotion, which, which was great. Um, and so everything was fine, right? Well, so I was doing my taxes the following year and I was looking back at my income from that year. And because I had taken maternity leave and such a significant, at the time it didn't feel significant, but it was such a significant portion of that maternity leave was unpaid. I had actually earned less money that year, the year that I got this major promotion than the previous year because I had chosen to have a child. The time when my expenses had gone up 50% with childcare, with diapers, with clothing, with food, with the hardest time in my life, it, it just basically felt like society was like, it's your problem, you deal with it. And guess what? We're actually going to reduce the income that you get. If you had done nothing, your income would have stayed the same. So at my next job, uh, un unrelated to this, I ended up switching jobs to another startup. And um, uh, how many people here have unlimited PTO at their employer? Right? It's like the, the perk du jour. So I was at this startup, and everybody you know, took unlimited, you know, availed of the unlimited PTO, as they should. If you have unlimited PTO, you should take it. So there's nothing wrong with that. But people would take a month off, and they'd go on vacation and do whatever, and uh, as they should. And then we had our first mom four years into the company, because that was how long it took, going on maternity leave. And we're like, oh, no, 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 no. You want to go on maternity leave? We're only going to pay you for partial time. This portion's unpaid. This portion's partial. This portion's fully paid. And I'm like, wait a minute. So we had people like going on vacation for a month, like no worries. They got their work done. We figured it out. But this person's going on maternity leave. And guess what? We're going to actually not pay her full pay. 
So this time I did not sit by silently. I like went to HR, I went to my manager, I went to my manager's manager, I went to my CEO. And actually they ended up changing the policy. I'd like to say it was because of me. I, I don't think it was just me. I actually think it was the changing tide of the industry in general. And I think that's why I'm super excited to talk about kind of the future of the workplace because I feel like the changing tide of the industry in general and the focus on these types of issues and shining a light on them, it's so easy for employers to be like, oh, I didn't know about, I didn't know that was a problem. Well, if nobody tells them, how would they know, right? So that's been my mission is to really okay. focus on these types of issues. Okay. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. High fives all around. Everyone, you two out there. Woo! And if if you if any of you have a burning question while we're talking, stand up. We we're this is relaxed. This is meant to be fun. This is meant to be interactive too. So I know we're standing up here like we're on a panel, but feel free to just just interrupt us. We're happy to share um, if if something um, you know hit a chord with you, just say wait. I want to. I have more. I have more on that topic. Um, so I'm going to jump in to some questions that we'll talk about. Um, very, very much in line with the introductions that just took place. But to start, I, I will say the question, and if one of you want to jump in first, fine. If it becomes a battle, then I'll mediate um, between you all. But I'm just going to throw out the question, and then if you're ready to start answering, um, we'll just do it. We'll see how that goes. So to begin with, um, we know that corporate culture and psychological safety is important in improving the lives of working parents. And it's important not just for parents, it's impor important for, for anyone that works in a corporation. Culture, the, the notion of psychological safety is that you can feel comfortable bringing your whole self to work. But culture doesn't shift on its own. Policies and programs need to change. So the question here for you all is, where do you think companies and organizations are right now as it pertains to the type of infrastructure and support for working parents? And what should they continue to be doing? Um, what do they need to start doing? What do they need to stop doing? And um, draw on your own experiences from your corporate backgrounds and your own entrepreneurial experience as well with all your connections that you have with um, women that you speak with in corporate America today, but we'd love any thoughts on that from whoever wants to dive in. Uh, <laughs> Dan has the microphone, so okay. we'll just start there. <laughs> um, I think the biggest innovation for parents has been flex time. Like there's probably no other single mm -hmm. thing that has happened within the workplace that has been more useful and more helpful to parents than flex time. I think though that like a lot of companies apply flex time differently, like flex mm -hmm. time doesn't mean the same thing in every company. And so I think that is one area where we could all improve. Um, if we could get a lot more alignment along, what does that really mean? And, and I mean, across like industries, Yes. Um, that would be, so flex time, one of the best innovations mm -hmm. in the workspace for parents. Mm -hmm. um, like unified application of what that means would be a, a drastic improvement because it would mean you could leave job A, go to job B. You could, you know, the, your portability of your career increases because you understand in advance, like flex time means this. Yep. Um, and that's, I don't have to like spend an hour talking to the recruiter. Mm -hmm. um, uh, most companies don't offer daycare on site. Um, I think for really big companies, that would be uh, an innovation that for any company, like, quite frankly, but it, it would be for any company. It makes it, I guess like the capitalist in me is right. a little bit like, you know, like let's make sure you can survive. <laughs> right, right. Um, that said, uh, any company that offers a subsidy for uh, childcare um, is is doing the right thing, and all companies should offer some sort of in a. In a I don't want to say incentive because that's the wrong word, but some sort of support mm -hmm. for childcare. Um, it will increase your worker productivity. It will increase worker happiness. Like it will just make your company more profitable and more efficient. Like almost every case study that's seriously done shows this. Yep. So. Yep. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Have child care on site, and it just seems that, like, you know, 
probably like the other perks like have food on site, it would mm -hmm. make people even more productive. Um, do you think that the region hasn't caught on yet? Like even with the other companies like maybe offer Yeah, I think that there's a lot of so much where you just need so many people to serve uh, to take care for that many parents who have children that large or I can jump in quickly. I'm not a policy expert. I'm not a child care expert by any stretch, but I've done a lot of reading on this. Um, it, it is a huge expense for sure. However, that being said, there are so many child care organizations that are partnering with companies and that expense is so much less and it's just a matter of companies taking this on as a priority. I mean, you have the bright horizons of the world. You have so many different um, you know, daycares that are doing this now, that are actually coming into corporate, I don't know what Atlassian has, but are coming into corporations and operating on their own, but the corporation has said, we have space for you. Um, but the liability for the corporation is not there. And so I get that asked too in our space, they're like, well, you're a co-working space for moms, are you offering childcare? And um, I'm never gonna say never, I, I'm in a I'm in a situation where I feel like I need to take care of her because in my journey or what it seems for me is like we preempt everything for our spouses and our kids and everyone else and somehow we get left way, way, way behind. So I feel like my job is to help her. But to answer that question, it's outsourcing, right? Like I um, will bring in a third party and say, hey, you know, we're going to offer our members discounted rates because I know it's a need because she needs to make sure they're in a safe space. But for me, having them, if you're in a building like this and you can put your kids on the second floor, your heartstrings are not getting tugged at whatsoever. But in a closer, uh, a smaller environment, it's counterproductive. You hear them, no one is taking care of your kid like you are, no matter how great the nanny is or whoever. I mean, at least that's what I think. I'm the best. <laughs> um, yeah, it's hard to tune it out and then you get sucked into that whatever. So, but I but outsourcing it is the is the best way where the company is basically advocating for you and saying it's important, which is what you know, we, we just had an event last I think being heard and knowing that like what you need is being met, you know, whether it's outside or inside, that's to me not the most important part, but just that it's being done and you're heard and your needs are being addressed and Oh, you yeah. The one thing, the one time I've seen it work really well was actually at Medtronic, and they had a partnership agreement with a, a daycare. Yeah. yeah, I was just gonna say, sorry, a, a friend of mine has a daycare business, so she's been talking to me a lot about the regulations, um, and I know that she's got a whole house for this, um, and she's only allowed to have six kids at a time. Uh, so I think a lot of it has to do with the regulations because you have to have like in your first year, I think you're only allowed to have six kids and then you can apply to have more. But if you've got kids under a certain age, you're only allowed to have four at a time, even in a house that has a couple of carriers. So the ratio isn't great, um, which means that if you have a whole business, you have to have a lot of people looking after them. That's in America and a lot of other countries. It's different. I know in like Canada, they've got places, co-working spaces where you can bring your kids um, and it's like a, on a drop-in basis. So I think a lot of it's because of the regulations here. But Netflix does do um, daycare for kids at their events. So if you go there for an event, you can bring your kids and keep them there. I mean, not forever. <laughs> I have two quick things I wanna add. One is I believe Google does have daycare on site. They at do. At least until recently, in but Cisco it's super and... oversubscribed. Like it's basically impossible to get your kids in, but still they have organic food and it's supposed to be amazing. I know Salesforce was opening their daycare uh, pretty recently and I knew some people pretty closely there. And so um, it, it's exactly what Des said. The licensing portion and the, the ratios can just, can be extremely difficult. The, the regulation in the United States is really high. You have to be really current with fire codes and um, emergency protocol and things like that. But the sadist in me wants to tell you the honest truth, which is I don't think it's a priority. So I think beer pong's been a priority. I think food's been a priority. I'm just being honest with you. Like I think other, other things have been a priority, catering to the people that have founded companies and what they were looking for at that life stage. I think Google's an exception because the founders were actually older and had more of a focus, excuse me, on other things. I think the majority of these companies were they founded by working moms, they would probably have a daycare before they had everything else, so. I mean, there was just recently an article that came out about Patagonia and the success that yeah. they've had. They have 100% retainment of 
working mothers because they have on-site childcare and they've really integrated their lifestyle. That is Patagonia. They are a unique brand in itself. They're very outdoor oriented, very family oriented, but it is an example and a model for what companies can achieve if they do put it as a priority. And it is, it is about that. It is about setting those annual strategic goals and where the dollars are going to be put. One thing I want to add, actually, is we talk a lot about the cost of things like in America, like capitalism, right? But the thing is, the cost of losing these employees is so high, mm -hmm. but nobody thinks about that. They're like, oh, the, in the near term, she's going to be pumping all the time. Her emotions are going to be out of, or I'm exaggerating, but you get my point. But then when we're trying to hire someone and you hire an agency and then you pay them a retaining, retainer fee, then you pay them a referral fee, then you, it's like all of this stuff is costing us so much money, not to mention the role is now empty because we did a bad job of supporting this mom who's experienced in the role when she's leaving. Uh, so to me, it's like a very myopic view and we need to change it. I think too, and coming back around with this question, um, about psychological safety and the, the notion of being able to bring your whole self to work. I think so many mothers traditionally have kept their, their, the fact that they're mothers kind of on the side. I've even heard stories of mothers saying, I'm not going to put my picture up on my desk because I don't want them. I want them to know that I'm dedicated. I want them to know that I'm here and I want to advance in this company. And if they see I have a family and children, they're going to think maybe I'm not as dedicated and serious in my job, which we know is not true. And it's sort of sacrilege to even say that, but it happens day in and day out. And so I think so much of what has to change to incorporations is this normalization around everyone has families and we all came from mothers. And if, if we have to leave early at four o'clock because we have a duty and an obligation to our children, that doesn't mean we're not you know, we don't want to advance in our career. That doesn't mean we don't care about the work that we are doing. We will, nine out of 10 times, we come back and we finish that later if we have a project. It should be about um, the, the work that you do, not when you do it. And the challenge still is more on um, the, what's the word I'm looking for? History is still plays a big part in where we are today. And when a woman does leave early for her children, it is, oh, she's gotta go, it's not normal. You know, and when a man tends to leave early, it still is applauded. And I'm not saying that is standard across the board, but it tends to be more applauded that, wow, what a great dad, they're going to, the, to, get, to be at the baseball game, yet, women don't get applauded for that as often. So not, not to throw, I'm not trying to throw men under a bus by any stretch because there are so many different stories that we all have, but I think it is normalizing this within our corporations that we all have things to do, whether it be a kids, whether it be other things in life, we have things to do. And as long as we get our work done, it shouldn't be, um, as long as we get our work done, period then everything else should be left away. Yes. So in this environment, particularly where we've seen this trend for like large open working spaces where everyone works rather than the traditional corporate environment where you have all these people are, are more separate. Do you feel like it makes it actually harder for women to physically like pack up off and walk out if you're exiting the room in front of all these other people and under pressure, or um, do you feel like the industry um, kind of accepts the fact that? Well, I, I mean, I, I can't. I have been out of corporate America for a while, but I, my assumption is is that if the company, it's it's like Patagonia. If your company motto or mission is to make these women feel empowered or comfortable in their pursuit of motherhood, then I don't think it's, if you pack up, it's just like you pack up. Um, if the company's not, not that way, then I would assume you probably feel it. Um, you know, th this, like, I'm not trying to age anyone in the room or, uh, or youth, overly euthanize them or you make them feel overly youthful, not euthanize, sorry, wrong word. Um, <laughs> so wrong word. Um, 
I I sat with a woman the other day and she's I'm 43. She was probably close to 50. And we were just talking about this very conversation and raising kids. And she was like, my hats go off to all the millennials. And typically I'd be lying if I said that there wasn't like at times some um, negative comments, but she was, she's right. She's like, these women, I mean, we paved the road in many ways to start these conversations, but the millennials really are like putting the smack down and saying, I'm just not staying as they become moms, right. As they transition. And that to me is super refreshing because at the stage I'm in where, you know, I've got this like old school work ethic and I'm like, you don't say no and you go to work and you work your ass off. And then, you know, you go home and it doesn't matter if you didn't sleep or eat or whatever else. And then you repeat. And these women are coming in. They're like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm peace out. I'm my kids at home and I got to go. And she's probably going to bust her ass at 11 o'clock and be okay with it and has the energy. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I think it's, it's part of it's like coming from this end of, from, a more youthful end, you know, and saying, these are my limits and I make no bones about it. And it is what it is. And part of it, it's companies just saying, Hey, we're going to embrace it. And I personally, if I could rewind, there are companies I work for, I wish I was just like, you know what? I, I gotta go. And I'm a better employee to you. If you let me do this, because I will, I will come back and complete, but I don't want to feel like I, I have to explain myself. Um, Anyway, that's my rant. Your turn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you addressed it a little bit already, but um, the issue I've been running into quite a bit in my career is having, because tech is getting significantly younger, I have tend to have bosses who are a bit younger than myself, who don't have kids, <laughs> and they, who are, you know, their lives are very, very different from mine. And really? So I have <laughs> I have the struggle of like trying to explain to you know someone who's you know not that far out of college um, like hey I have to you know come in later some days I have to like leave earlier some days I have to work from home because my kid is sick and I mean we do have you know the flexibility of like working from home and um, unlimited time off and whatnot but I often feel like there's because he does they like they don't have that familiarity with a parent working parent's life there's I guess a bit of, um, they don't quite understand exactly. And they have a different perception. Like they see it like, oh, you know, she's coming in late all the time because like they don't quite get it. How do we start that dialogue with, you know, working with like, for example, lots of others younger than us who don't quite get it. How do we like lay that smack down, down, so to speak? <laughs> I don't have a great answer for you. Uh, but to answer the previous question, which is in conjunction actually with yours, I actually felt that there was less pressure. Uh, like the, the open environment did mean people would see me departing and that was a problem. But I felt like being on the customer side, it was like, well, I could be leaving for a flight. I mean, we travel on site to customers all the time and half my team's gone. We don't have any desk phones. Like, but I felt like there was more pressure to hang out at the office and be social and like everyone's friends were at work and we should like drink together and do this together. And I was like, I got to go. My babysitter's leaving. Like I have to leave now. Like you don't understand. Um, I have worked in environments that where both are true. Like I've worked in environments where people are really young, but they are really empathetic. And I've worked in environments where people are really young and they're really not empathetic. And then finally I've chosen the environment where everyone has kids. And so even if they're not majority or even close to majority moms, they're dads. And I think dads actually swallow a lot of these like bullets Dan too, where it's like, they also are like secretly sneaking out for karate pra practice. And like, you know, my kid is doing the millennial dads, especially, I think there's more pressure on them at home to be present. And so I think it's important to push back and really explain. Like I, my, I don't even remember this, but my old manager was telling me, he's like, you really convinced this is going to sound terrible. He's like, you really convinced me not to have kids because you were like, every morning in our one-on-one, -on -one, he's like, we used to meet at 9 a.m. I have no memory of this at all. It's like, we used to meet at 9 a.m. and used to be like, I'd be like, how was your morning? And he'd be like, you'd, you'd respond, I did this, I did this, like Alicia threw up on me, then I did this, and I changed it. And he's like, man, I'm just waking up, man. I just got in the office. Like, <laughs> so I my my solution was to really push it to them. Like, and when I had my second kid, I was really aggressive. I was like, I have to go to the mother's room. I'll be back. Like, I would literally walk out of a meeting, like dial in and, and come back, which I, I just made it uncomfortable for other people because I feel like women have been swallowing too many of these bullets for too long. So 
I don't know if that was the right solution, but that was my solution. Yeah, no, that's, I think it's amazing that you could, that you can do that. Um, to answer your question too, at Mom Warrior, very specifically, we've built programming very specifically for managers who are not parents. And the programming is really around empathy. It's around empathy and understanding purely because if we understand one, an one another and what we're going through in our home environments, whether that be because we have child obligations or something else, if we understand that, then we are more open to um, appreciating each other. And so it really does stem um, from the empathy and understanding piece for sure. Okay. Oh. After you. Um, so functionally, um, w what I like is to set expectations early, sit down, have a meeting, say, this is sort of my situation and, um, what I, what I have done, what I did myself when I was, uh, at IBM and I knew I had to like, I'm to be working this insane schedule is I laid it all out and then showed specifically where I'd be working and talked about the reasons why. And, uh, luckily I had a really good boss, um, and uh, she was really accommodating. But on the flip side, I've also worked at companies where I I was uh, the single dad long enough that I got the, ugh, he's leaving again, you know, um, and, and an audible, ugh. Um, so in that situation, um, I had to make a decision that like, this is my life. And I, I did the same thing. I had a meeting, here's my expectations, here's my why I have these things. Um, but I didn't get the re like the returning understanding and like, okay, you know, um, and at that point, like I just emphasize where, where I'm being productive. Um, I didn't end up staying at that company. So I was just going to say real quick to your question is that I, um, I have also worked my, the last, um, well, the last startup I worked for was for a man who was considerably younger than me. He was married, but he had no kids and I won't get into uh, my opinions on him, but that's, um, that's nor here nor there. But, um, I think at that time I was at a place where I was taking jobs, um, that on paper sounded like the right job and felt like it might do something for my career. And I think what I've learned most in addition to the pushback is that you, and maybe I'm not saying you're not in the company that is like your dream company. So just take it with a grain of salt, but that you pick the companies that you feel most aligned with, whether that's in their mission or in their product or whatever, because then they they get you. And that has probably been one of my biggest downfalls as far as jobs in that that was not aligned. And so it was hard for me to speak what I needed. And for them, you know, just to your point, we're like the, the one company that did it and the second where IBM was like, yeah, no problem, we got it. Um, I think, you know, when you bring a certain level of experience and talent to a company, they recognize that and they want to embrace that. So you just have to find the one that's going to see you for who you are. So I'll jump into a couple other questions since I'm not sure the time, but make sure you keep me on track too. <laughs> um, so um, along these same lines, um, in the U.S., the belief is that you, you can be a great mother or a great worker, but you can't be both. The facts, according to the research, don't corroborate this, but women still suffer for it. We've discovered a number of studies that show working mothers are indeed a lucrative asset for companies, that women are more productive than their peers over the course of their careers yet the workplace stats are at odds with these findings. Almost 80% of women are less likely to be hired if they are mothers, and they're also half as likely to be promoted. Working mothers also earn an average of $11,000 less in salary, even as they are held to higher standards than their peers. So the question is, what do you think about this? Do you agree with it or not? Um, and if you have experienced it, can you share your story? That was a multi-part question. So take whatever part from that that resonates. I, I left corporate. So my, my, when I face a corporate question, I get a little like, oh. So stuff is super depressing for me. It's like, uh, <laughs> it's like every, isn't there like a stat? Every child you have, you make like 10K less or something. And I mean, yeah, um, I, I, yeah, I find that super depressing. I think it's, I think it's unfortunate, you know, for a society to not value something like having children, which is like perpetuating the, the human race, like is, is not valuable and not important. Um, I, 
I don't know that I've personally felt that I'm held to a higher standard, but I feel like I held myself to a higher standard, which was honestly the same standard before I had a kid, right? So like, I think that's where we kind of run into problems, especially when I had my first child. I was like, everything will be great. I'll be like, you know, doing this and doing pumping and like not sleeping all night and getting vomit on my shirt, but I'll be at work. Like <laughs> same time, I'll leave same time, no big deal. And and then you, you know, for, for moms that do, or dads that do end up doing it, it ends up coming, it not, there's no grain of like free lunch. Uh, and especially the first year, I think is a big transition for your whole family. And so I think that really runs in, you can maybe accomplish everything at work and everything at home, but then you are suffering from depression because it's like, this is very overwhelming. I'm exhausted and you pay others secret costs. Um, uh, this is a, a slight segue, but I, I read a recent article about just how a uh, medium post actually about how ma how women in general have always been called the weaker sex, but there's so many things we go through that we just marginalize and don't share. Like the, the terrors or like pains of childbirth or like period or like cramps or like things that like in society are like, ah, don't mention that to me. That's super inappropriate. Um, so, so to me, it's really just pushing the envelope as much as you can giving yourself space, like telling yourself. So with my second kid, I was really clear with my boss. I was like, Hey, I'm going to be coming in at 10 every day. I'm going to be leaving at 4:45 every day. Like, is that cool? And he literally would keep ignoring my, my like message. Cause this is, this is me being like setting protocol. Right. And on the third time he's like, yeah, man, can you stop asking me? Like, yes, it'll be fine. Like, and so I, I think to some extent we also, and, and I'm not saying this is true everywhere. I'm not saying every work environment is super flexible and supportive, but I also think we need to give ourselves a break to say, Hey, and actually I would say lean in really helped me with this where it's like, you take a step back for six months or a year, you give yourself time, you give yourself space. It doesn't mean you've quit. It doesn't mean you failed. Like you're doing a hundred percent on both ends and one person can only do so much. So for me, that was, that was really the big lesson. Yeah. I think, um, so the stat that said working mothers make $11,000 less on average. One of our missions with Mom Warrior is very much focused on this notion of we want to see more women in the C-suite. We want to see more executives out there, more women on boards. And one of the things that consistently happens is this leaky pipeline where you have a lot of women, you're 50-50 in companies at the entry level. And then as you progress in that company, women fall out. So what is the issue there? There are, it's very complex, it's not easy, but we very much believe that there are a lot of women that drop out of the workforce in their traditional career paths because trajectories in traditional corporations are still very ingrained in a manner of, you pass through manager, then you get senior manager, then you pass through that and you get director and you pass through this linear acceleration. And that doesn't always have to be. So we're, t we're definitely trying to shift the paradigm because what happens is women become mothers and they say, I can't do the same kind of work that I was doing and be the mother that I'd like to be. And so they step out and they look for alternative jobs that are more flexible. This is a large part why that decrease in salary is happening. So we definitely believe that if we can solve keeping more women in their careers in the workforce, we are thereby solving more women in executive positions, more women in the C-suite. And in order for that to happen, corporations do need to make changes. We are not in the 1940s. We're not an industrialized society. We do not all have one parent working at home, taking care of every single thing um, at home. Um, and things have shifted, things have changed, and co corporations need to make those shifts too. Um, I, I think for myself, like the first thing that we all should do is acknowledge that it is harder. It is harder to be a parent and be successful and be ambitious and, and pursue. So like, I think like one of the things I had to do was decide like, how much am I going to invest in this? And, um, and, and it's not an easy decision, right? Like it would have been really easy for me to, to pick a slightly lower level job that had a more stable, uh, working hours, less demand, um, but still paid enough to, you know, pay the bills. Um, and I chose not to do that. And so I, I guess like, first of all, I recognize that that's my choice. Um, 
but at the same time, like I was lucky enough to work at a company that had supportive structures that had flex time. It had, you know, um, all these things. What I really do wonder though, like is the gender disparity, um, because I am male. So I really like, I don't have that experience. I can't, like, I don't know. Um, on the other end of it. So for pay disparity, obviously that's shit. Um, and for any portion of it that is based in bias, like that should just, that's illegal and should be reported and, and there are remedies for that. Um, what I really, one of some of the things that are beginning to happen, especially in tech, we're in many ways lucky and both cursed and lucky in tech. Um, but one of the uh, interesting things that's happening is ways to deal with pay disparity. Um, so that pay is less tied to, um, or base pay is less tied directly to your performance and it's less, uh, less mungible to, to people's biases. Um, any systems that you put in place that are, that allow pay to be like completely leveled and market-based, I'm like, I have some questions about that, but, uh, right. that can help balance that. Yep. Women who do not have children, or is it women and men? Very specifically, mothers. And we actually have some great data on this that if we get contact info, I'm happy to share the very specific data points. But in this case, it is mothers, working mothers, I'll, um, earn an average of 11000 less in salary. Um, and I, I believe that stat is out of the women that are earning less in salary, the mothers earned less than women who are not mothers. And we do have some great data on that. Um, and I'm happy to share all those details with you via email after. Anything else? No? Or how are we on time? Yep. Okay. I've got a couple more questions, but is there any, I, I'm kind of, sorry, I'm going to throw, throw it for a loop with the panel, but is there anything from the audience that's a burning topic that you think um, you'd really like to hear about from any of us? I have a question. Um, what's the advice you would give to managers who are, who have people in their teams who are either from parents or uh, you know, like I, I manage a larger team, and many, many people become parents, and so I've, you know, I've experimented with different styles, but I think what's always in the back of my head is like, how do I aggressively develop their careers and, and set them up for success, similar to everybody else on the team, right? Mm -hmm. um, so with that perspective in mind, love any. Did you say specifically men was your question early on? No. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. I'll, I'll pass this on, but encourage your men who are becoming parents to take their paternity leave if they have it, all of it, because our stats are, even if companies are offering it, men are not taking it because of the bias around, well, you don't have the boob, you know, what are you doing at home? So, um, and, and men are facing a bias around taking it. And there, there is actual, st still to this day is what, you know, you, you don't need to take that and encourage them to take their full paternity leave if it's offered, because it's wonderful that it's offered too. I just have to echo that. I um, sat with a woman today who is a um, social media strategist and she's British. And so we were talking about just um, the breakout of uh, fathers taking paternity leave in Europe. And I was saying like, it needs to be mandatory because they need to feel what it feels to go through it. Or if they're sleep deprived or whatever else, then there's empathy built in being able to say, yeah, I'm not 100% with it when I get to work. So, you know, I, I have also in, in my space, it's like, it's all about the woman, it's all about the woman. And Ted and Christy have um, very kindly opened my eyes to the fact that it's men that support us that are really going to help propel this forward. Because yes, we're all coming together as women, which is amazing and important. But men, you know, that get it, 
need to also help push that forward because right now with it not being fully equal, they are our best allies, um, which was a big high five to you guys for <laughs> teaching an old dog some new tricks. <laughs> So I can add a couple things. Uh, I definitely think the paternity leave is an important one. It's also from a biased perspective when you're hiring somebody, you're like, oh, she's just gonna go on maternity leave, but now it's like he might go on paternity leave. You don't know, and you can't even tell if his wife's pregnant. So um, I do think, yeah, I think pushing people to take their full leave, I think um, having the, the questions early on, like I think the person themselves are really, they're usually really struggling. Like they're like the duck that's like swimming, you know, with their legs furiously underwater. And I feel like there's a big culture in our society to be like, everything's great. Oh my God, being a mom is amazing. Like I'm so, are you so happy? I'm so happy. And they're dying. Like they're miserable. They're really unhappy. Like they're very stressed. They don't know what to do. Their, their life has exploded and like they don't know how to handle it. So I feel like there were a couple of conversations pretty early on Actually, the second one, my daughter was like quite grown up actually. And I just started crying. I was like, I'm very overwhelmed. Like this culture of like staying at the office and like playing beer pong till eight o'clock is like not working for me. Nobody here understands because nobody here has kids. So I think really pushing the envelope being like, are you okay? Like, what else can we do? How are you feeling? Like, um, it's funny. My husband asked me recently, he's like a, a woman on his team and had a baby. And he's like, so I shouldn't send her our workshops anymore. Right. And I was like, uh, he's like, wrong. I'm supposed to like ask her what she wants to do. Maybe she wants to go on more work trips and take breaks from the baby. I was like, what have you been reading? Like, <laughs> so, but I, but I, but that brings up an important nuance around travel. So like, I feel like my boss was really like, gave me the option when I needed to travel and really made it feel like it was my decision even if it may not have actually been my decision, but was like, you should really go on this. If I were you, I would really go on this trip without it being like, you have to go on this trip. And having the flexibility around travel, I would say is another big one. And then finally, like, uh, similar to, to what Dan's spoken about, like, and I, I think this lady told us about, like the lack of empathy towards flexibility, especially at the beginning. Like I've definitely experienced that firsthand from people that I don't even know that it's, I mean, of course, like they don't have kids, they don't understand, but like they also just didn't care, right? So it was like when I first started one of these roles, I wanted to work from home one day a week. My daughter was really young and they were basically like, no. And I should have just known them that I shouldn't have joined the company because I was like, this is obviously not the right place for me. Um, so just being, I mean, being empathetic to somebody's needs, like what do you, like maybe the commute's killing them. Maybe like the babysitter is actually leaving at five, maybe their nanny quit. You know, there's all this stuff going on behind the scenes that people feel nervous to share. So really pushing them to share even if they don't want to. And I feel like they'll they'll actually let you in on a lot of things that are going on behind the curtain. Yeah, and and really quickly too, that any time you have an employee that's going on maternity or paternity leave, that's not, at least for women, it's not a giant surprise. You have usually five months of knowledge, maybe four, maybe six, depending on when they share. You have so much time to prepare for that employee to leave. And it's always this scramble at the end. Like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? We have someone that's missing from our team for um, four months, five months, three months, whatever it may be, but there is such a preparation time and that is such an opportunity. It's a learning and development team opportunity. That is when you get together as a team, you share about who's going to take on these responsibilities. You work together so that when that individual leaves for maternity or paternity, they feel safe. They feel like it's okay. My team is pulling for me. I won't come back to a billion emails and nothing having been done. And I don't have someone vying for my job either, but you've really used that opportunity as a true learning and development teamwork opportunity. And that is what's missing too. It's literally someone goes off on maternity and then the world's crashing down because who is gonna pick up all the slack? Um, and they're still hunting, maybe if it's an external replacement, they're still hunting for that person days before um, someone goes on maternity leave, and that could be solved, I think, very simply with just um, bringing that team together. Um, so, a couple things, I guess. Um, I have a one-to-one, -one, like most all of us ever do, um, and uh, it's an hour once a week. 15 minutes of that time is always blocked for growth. So for my people on my team that have kids, um, part of that growth planning is also planning around how to scope their work. Part of that uh, growth planning is like, how do you, when do you have meetings? When's the best time for you to have meetings? Do you need to have meetings in person? Do you need to, like, we go through that kind of stuff. Um, you know, you're trying to think of something that isn't an actual example. <laughs> um, you know, your 
child is uh, needs to like broke their leg and they have to be in physical therapy twice a week. So, you know, you start like always be paying attention to what's happening in their lives to an empathetic degree and then tie that into how you approach growth, right? Like, and if somebody's really aggressive, then like sit down with them and say like, okay, you're really ambitious. You really want to achieve. You've got the skills, you've got the motivation. Let's talk about what this means to your life and what, you know, what costs you're willing to pay and which, uh, what, what flexibility we need to provide. Um, there's always, there's all, not always, there's almost always a way to work through the situation that still allows that person to achieve and grow. Um, so my housemate works at a small stars up. They've got like eight people. And I, I know we've talked about this, um, where I was like, like if someone went to maternity leave, like what would that be like for you? And I don't think they have great policies around that, but they're like, we're a really small company. If someone went to maternity leave and we had to pay them for that entire time, and then we have to find someone else to do that work. And it's really hard when we're really tiny. Um, I guess, how do we argue against that? How do we tell small companies to still do better? And how do they do that even if they're really small? Uh, I'll let you all talk, but I do believe anything is possible with planning. I really believe that. And if you say that the example is a small company where you'd have to pay that individual for their maternity leave and then backfill, it's more challenging for sure. I'm not saying that that would be a, a simple, simple process. And I don't think I have the perfect answer. But I do believe with planning and coming together as a team, I, I really do believe anything is possible. Maybe, maybe I'm too optimistic in that. But, um, but yeah, the bigger the company, the, the less, um, they sh they, they're not off the hook, big companies at all. Um, smaller companies, you know, I, I think there are ways. I think it just is a, is create, it needs to be created. You are actually are a small company. Um. So my answer is sucked up. <laughs> so uh, I mean, to Christy's point, you have a lot more time when planning something like a maternity leave. You have like five months, four months, six months, but significant time notice. I had uh, people, I mean, I'm sure there are plenty of stories in this room actually from people management, but I had somebody on my team who had a very serious illness who basically like, I mean, they had to leave to get treatment and it was like one day's notice right they got their diagnosis and it was like monday i need to start i need to be in the hospital every day for six weeks and we weren't like how are we going to manage the team's being let down by you you're like depending like it's like whoa they're really sick this is a serious problem like having a baby is a serious life change like their body might be cut open like they might be recovering from surgery like if somebody broke their leg you wouldn't be like you're really not doing your part because you broke your leg while you were outside we make this having a baby thing like it's a choice which it totally is a choice but sometimes the timing is not the choice the experience is not the choice the way it happens the type of baby is definitely not the choice <laughs> you can all agree to that so so we put so much onus on the person we're like you really let us down you're one of the eight you really did this you did that guess what it's three months guys like it's six months like it's such a temporary period and she will work for you for the rest of her life because she'll be like this is the company that was there for me when i needed someone the most i don't know that's my answer <laughs> i guess getting smaller companies to employ thinking of having kids being like even though this is going to happen, there are all of these other benefits that are going to come to you because of that, and being able to articulate that to them. Um, hi. Ultimately, I think this is a very difficult problem and it will take a lot of effort to go company by company to help them connect the dots that long term this is beneficial to you. So with that context, I'd like to understand um, whether you've done any work from a public policy standpoint, because ultimately if we want everyone to move, it has to come from policy, because um, no one's really just gonna be altruistic and do it on their own. 
I have um, mm -hmm. done quite a bit of. Um, See, this is your question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because I'm like, I have so, um, I worked with Planned Parenthood to um, increase the amount of paternity leave in Minnesota's uh, state workers. Um, so I worked with both Planned Parenthood and the state worker union um, to increase their paternity leave. Um, that was an interesting thing because you also had to navigate the political um, mishigash. Um, and uh, that, so that was one thing. Um, working with Planned Parenthood to do nationwide uh, paternity leave, um, you know, it's, it's a long, long, hard slog. Changing public policy is, is uh, a challenge. But I think a couple of things, uh, well, two things are really changing the landscape. One, um, millennials, like the generation coming up is, is like done with the, yeah. the bullshit, right? Like, and it's so awesome to yeah. see. Um, and I think that is probably one of the bigger motivating factors. So two things, one, the marketplace is changing. So competitive pressure is gonna be a major factor in every company very soon. Um, all the big companies are now offering some, not all, but yeah. a large portion of the big companies are offering some form of paternity leave and maternity leave. And so competitive pressure is gonna play a big role. Um, the changing tide is going to change, play a big role. It's hard to tell what's going to happen in public policy. I mean, it really is uh, difficult to, to know. I don't know of any major uh, initiatives right now, just because we're kind of caught in this mire that we're stuck in politically right now. But um, <laughs> when we have sane leaders again, maybe uh, I think one of the big pushes <laughs> will be along the line. Well, Senator, uh, oh my God, Senator, uh, who just did this major uh, childcare proposal, Warren, Warren thank you. Warren. God, <laughs> Elizabeth Warren's childcare proposal is potentially one, a really effective way to make sure that all women and all persons can work um, and work effectively and work uh, to like build a career. That's a like sort of a broken all over the place mm -hmm. answer. Um, should I wrap up with one more question for the panel or time-wise, is that all right? Okay, well, let me let me wrap up with this question, which will probably spur additional questions from the audience, and then we can just, I don't know, talk about all of this. <laughs> um, so as we wrap up, if you could design the perfect workplace where working parents could thrive in both their careers and in parenting, what would it look like? There's actually one comment I wanted to make around this, which is um, I think it's I think it's interesting that we have a dad on the panel, and then we talked a little bit about men taking paternity leave, and we talked about like the standards women are under. There's a lot of pressure women put each other under as well. Like I was on a business trip, and this customer had traveled from Europe for this business trip, and she had a a child, and we're talking, and then I mentioned I had two young children, and she's like, "How do you travel for work?" It's like, how do you travel for work? You're here from Europe. Like, and the irony was I was traveling with my coworker who was um, a single parent, but he was a man. So everyone assumed, oh, your wife must be home with the kids. And the irony is my husband had just resigned from his job and his, his schedule was actually super flexible. For me to go on this business trip was actually really easy. And for him to come on the business trip was actually really difficult. So when I think about the future of the workplace and the future of how things work, like, I don't think it really is that much to do with having children. I think I think that's a big part of all of this. And of course, mom warrior and being parents, obviously like having children is a big part. It's the big change in your life, but it's actually flexibility around these life events to be able to have support at any stage of your life, right? Like when I gave the example of the person who was really sick, for example, right? Or like things like that, like people have needs outside of work and it's not only when they have children. What are we doing to design a workplace that's really supportive of people to bring their whole selves to work across a variety of spectrum of the spectrum, including of course, having children is a big one of them. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So I, I come from a slightly different perspective because though I've had corporate um, years back, I am um, a serial uh, entrepreneur and I have an extreme passion and love for small business and where I will never sell work-life balance because I don't think that 
exists. And if it does, someone please call me. But um, in my experience, it doesn't. I feel that being self-employed has been the closest I've ever been able to sort of touch that because at the very least, I'm navigating my own schedule. If I want to work like crazy and take on extra clients or whatever, I can. And if I'm at a point where you know, my child is sick and I can't come to whatever, I am also dictating that and I make no, you know, I'm okay with what I take or don't take. It's at my, it's at my leisure or however much I want to push myself. So um, where that doesn't answer potentially the corporate question, I think that I find that women as, um, that they step away to, to, to from their careers to raise children, that becoming an entrepreneur in that, taking their skill set as an attorney or an accountant or, um, any line of work then spins into being self-employed. Um, and I think that is a very viable way for at least finding your own rhythm with your family, whatever that is, whether you're traveling or not traveling or whatnot. So I advocate for that. <laughs> Ooh, um, boy, what would I, what would I design if I could design the perfect workspace? Um, well, it would definitely be flexible. Um, it would definitely have aspect like childcare on site or the availability of near-site childcare, um, paid for like in full. Um, and I mean, that's sort of a dream situation, but if you think about it economically over the long term, that's a good investment for most companies. Um, uh, and it can be in partnership and it can yeah. be, you know. Um, I think under, like the, to, what, to your point, the increase of empathy across the work spectrum like under like being willing to understand where another person is coming from is so critical in our changing workplace and and is so critical to being a decent workplace for parents um those that's uh, a key element i think um there is something to be said for clear policies it sort of goes back to what i was saying about like defining flex time across industries mm -hmm. so that everybody could understand what that meant. Um, so I think like that ubiquity of certain policies would, would really improve the life at the workplace because we're all like so many of us are mobile workers, right? Like we'll work here for two years or here for five years or whatever, but like very few of us anymore work like at a company for tw the, our, the entirety of our career. So that portability becomes a really important part of all of our careers. And so like that's where policy work really matters, right? Like understanding what things mean and what things mean between different companies, like that is critical. So like having that upfront and obvious, I think is- Absolutely. Thing. So let's throw this to the audience. If you, what would you want more than anything else in a company, even if it was, you know, part of your dream, what would it look like? Does anyone have any thoughts? Um, one thing would be to make part-time work easier. Um, so after my first kid was born, I came back 30 hours a week, um, which I then kept at 30 hours a week for the rest of my time at Oracle. Um, but I always had to defend it. And so Part-timers, it's like when you're a part-timer and you're working with people who are like, you know, working 60 hours a week or whatever, you basically have stepped off the career path. You know, you are not going to get any promotions and you have to defend yourself all the time. It's like, hello, I also get paid, you know, 25% less than you do. Um, but, you know, that's something that, that having part-time work be much more practical and, you know, even be, even now that I am a joyful empty nester, um, just barely. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, big kick. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, I still have reasons that I need to be part time. And so I'm working part time as a contractor currently. And, you know, for me now, well, my mother is 80 and she needs to have me visit her a lot. You know, so stuff like that. It's, it's not just being a parent, but you always need to be having flexibility. And again, you know, dealing with part-time stuff gracefully. I really like that. Absolutely. And, you know, I have friends who are attorneys and friends who are doctors. 
and they were able to flex back a bit. Yet my friend who's a doctor, she's still a doctor. And my friend who's an attorney who went three days a week, she's still an attorney. When you take it down a notch in corporate America, if you are head of a department, then what are you? There is no step back. You, you don't step down to an entry level position because you're two days a week. And so that in, in the business world is very different. Um, and then the second piece is another thing that Tet and I advocate for a lot is this notion of sharing positions. And that is, again, also very complex. And we've done that to date as an example. So we are co-CEOs and guess what? She was supposed to moderate this tonight. Her child was sick and it's okay because we both are very much in line with what we're doing, where we're moving towards. And I think a lot more discussion around that would be valuable because you can carry on at the level that is appropriate for you in a shared role. And again, complex, but interesting thought process. There's actually one more thing around that that I would add, which has been super fascinating to me, is uh, the academic schedule in the US for public school. So, uh, so first of all, there's no preschool, right? Like kids start school and they're five. So zero to five, you're on your own. Like you figure out childcare, which is, which is the reality of the situation, whether you think it's good or bad is, is your decision. And then when they start school at five, it ends at two o'clock. So which job ends their day at two o'clock? So it's like, okay, drop off. You can drop off anywhere between, this is, this is just the exact schedule I've just been given for my daughter's kinder class. It's like between 7.45 and eight. And then you have to pick her up between, you know, I think it's like 1.30, one day, one day a week, it's like a half day. And then the rest of the week, we, yeah, you, all, you guys know, you all have kids. Um, and it's like 2.30 the rest of the week. And I'm like, there is no job in America where if you're working full time, to your point, that ends at 2.30, right? Unless you're starting at five o'clock, in which case you're probably not dropping your kids off. So I'm like, and, and, then, and then there's three months off for the summer where it's like, you're on your own, please figure out childcare, right? So, so to me, we have to, the workplace has to evolve in terms of schedule and flexibility, but like the educational system also has to evolve in terms of workplace, like matching the schedule and not assuming that there's a parent home that's gonna always be available, so. The, the four day a week, the four day a week work week is also very interesting because if you have two working parents, you can have one that works from Tuesday to Friday, one that works from Monday to Thursday. And guess what? You've minimized your, your child care story there too. So that's also another interesting future of workplace thought. Okay. <laughs> um, anyone else out there that has, yep. Yeah. So we haven't talked about performance management. I'll tell you a story about myself. I had my first child. I was at IBM for 22 years and I was rated at the end of the year, um, dinged because my relative contribute, my contribution relative to others' contributions wasn't as much because I was out for three months. So I would like to see some way that corporations, big or small, somehow take that into account when they are assessing their employees. And I don't know whether there's any progress with regards to that, there's any talk around that, but that has been one of my many issues. So, <laughs> um, well, of course, every company has their own policy, yada, yada. Um, but from my own experience, um, I've been very deliberate about not tagging people for taking maternity or paternity leave. Um, and you should get a bonus and, for taking your leave. Because I mean, takes it, so. yeah. That's I, <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, she, she said oh, you I should get a bonus for taking your leave because almost nobody ever does. Nobody yeah. Does. So like yeah. we should be encouraging should people to really take it. Like there should actually be an incentive to take the leave. I, I concur. Um, I guess like when I think about growth, when I think about uh, career trajectory, it is one of the harder things. Like it was the hardest thing for me to do. Um, 
I made I made some bad trade offs. Like I I worked way too much. I and uh, and drowned myself um, and did end up depressed and all of that. So I've tried to find ways for the people on my teams to. Um, well, I, 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 like I was saying earlier, right? Like we sit down, we talk about like, what are your expectations? What is your situation? Um, and then what are your goals? And then like, how do we fit your goals into those expectations? And, and some of it, it all kind of comes back to flexibility, but a lot of it is really just about like, you can be here from two to seven, right? Or two to four, let's say. Let's say you only could be in the office two hours a week and all the rest of the time you had to work from home for a variety of reasons. Okay. Who are the people you need to talk to to advance the work that you do? Are they available during those times? Are they available during, you know, like there are almost always solutions. Um, and then the other side of that, though, is I expect people to, to show up and be professionals and do their job um, and, you know, work with me to find those solutions. Um, I don't have a really great answer um, for that specific situation. I wish I did, but I, I do my best to never ding people for taking leave um, as a part of their performance. Like I judge their performance on the time they were there. I think it goes back to our priorities as a society. Like we're like, oh, you took maternity leave. You're a terrible human being. You didn't, you weren't here. Then, so you get like nine months of the, like three quarters of the pay or whatever it is, right? I didn't get dinged like performance wise, but I didn't get paid, right? So I totally understand and empathize. But I think it goes back to what we were saying earlier. It's a super myopic view. Now this person's pissed off. They're going through the toughest time in their life. We've just told them, hey, you're actually not performing at the same level because you chose to have a baby and you chose to take maternity leave. And guess what? They're going to leave. And we're going to have to look for somebody that's going to be as qualified, it's going to be as experienced, it's going to have all the same stuff. It's such a pain to find a replacement. We just don't think about that as society, which is shocking to me. It's really unfortunate because it's going to be so much more work to find that person. So like. I guess there's one thing. Humidity, honestly, I was just gonna say it's. Um, there's one thing we haven't really talked about. We've sort of all been talking about the more idealized world that a lot of us apparently live in. Like in tech, we work for decent companies. A lot of us have talked about like working for decent companies. Like if you work at Walmart, this is a whole different situation. I think like all of us need to do a better job of advocating for the folks who don't work in jobs and companies like we have because the vast majority of the world does not look like our world and is not our experience. And it is still like almost impossible to make progress. You do get fired, you do get dinged. Um, like these are realities that exist in the vast majority of the working world. And I, I just like, I hate to be a bummer, but like I wanted to remind us all that like, we are a part of what I hope will be the future of work. So the example we set matters. And how we show that that is valuable and profitable and, and, and the more we do things like this and go out and talk about it, and especially from a business perspective, like entrepreneurs and, and things like that, so important. So. The other thing I would add uh, on the tech sector in particular, like the unemployment rate in San Francisco is less than 2%. So companies have to adapt to be able to recruit good talent. If the economy turns and um, particularly in tech, do they have to continue to offer these things or will there be, you know, an availability of talent where they don't need to? And um, so hopefully we make enough progress. So if that happens, we don't go backwards. Mm -hmm. I just want to say, hearing some of the ideas around um, how to solve for, so like co co um, role or you know bonus when you take your leave or pushing for maternity uh, paternity leave, that's so exciting. And because you you brought up a really good point, is the burning thing that I was wanting to talk about is like, ah, oh, we have kind of a certain lens that we're looking through, but as a culture, how do we shift our culture and to share a story, um, I, I was raised in American culture, so I had that kind of, um, you know, oh, you have to, you have to work and be ambitious and go after your career, and then um, had a baby in Sydney in an Australian culture, opposite, like, oh, you're gonna go back to work? What kind of mom are you? And it was shocking. I was like, whoa, this is a totally different culture. Um, and, and, you know, like, how do we balance that? So, yeah, I'm, I'm really keen to hear your thoughts on, as a culture, how do we shift that aside from the co-role or, um, you know, 
praising or, or bo giving a bonus, recognizing, oh, this is your first year of becoming a parent. Oh, good on you. Let's, you know, let's support you. So yeah, what are you, what are your thoughts on how do we help shift aside from just millennials speaking out or, you know, all the things? Yeah. My favorite story about culture is, uh, this is not really going to answer your question, but it's a funny story. So, but it, but it, I think it goes back to the standards we put on ourselves and the pressure we put on ourselves. So I just had my daughter, I was working a lot, I was feeling a lot of stress, probably like 15, 16 months. She was pretty young. And I went to India to attend a wedding and I'm talking to another mom at this wedding whose kid is, I forget at this time, but let's, let's, let's say like nine or 10 months. And we're talking and she's like, yeah, it's been crazy. He's so crazy. We have two nannies. I'm like, oh, you have two nannies. Like, that's cool. And she's like, and then we keep talking and she's like, and I live with my in-laws, which is very common in India, right? You live in a joint family. So I'm like, okay, so you have grandparents in their home and you have two nannies for this one kid. She's like, yeah, but I had to like put him in daycare. Cause like, <laughs> she's like, cause I can't get anything done when he's at home. I'm like, so when he's at home with the two nannies and the two grandparents, you can't get anything done. I was like, so do you have, you know, your own business or like, you know, what do you do? She's like, well, you know, like I go to like a workout class or like a, <laughs> so to your point about culture, I, I think you, you bring up a really good point about like being in Sydney and how they're like, you're a terrible mom. But then here it's like, your, your mom's so wild. You should be gangbusters, like guns blazing, like doing everything on your own. And it's like, it's refreshing to go to other cultures and learn that like, you don't have to put yourself under so much stress. Like it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to like take a break. It's okay to do whatever. It's we we do get caught up in kind of our view. Like, um, I didn't want to say this earlier, but I'll say it now. So you said a lot about like the working world, <laughs> but I I think the U.S. is very unique in how we don't give support to parents and how we don't help. And and the U.K. for sure yes. has a lot of challenges in the U.K. right now. Yeah. Um. I mean, I was talking to somebody again about the parental leave in India and they're like, oh, the Indian government just changed it. It's three months paid at the federal level. And I was like, wow, that's better than the U.S. And it was, she was like, yeah, like we didn't even look at the U.S. as an art. Like, like it was like, please, what, you think the U.S. is the best at everything? Like we didn't even think about what the U.S. is doing. And I was like, oh man, <laughs> great. Hey, awesome. there, there's a lot of articles out there that says we're primed right now to leapfrog all of this and become uh, you know, the model of a Sweden and a Norway for all of our parental policies. Um, but again, I'm not a policy expert and I, that is not the area that I can speak about, but wouldn't it be nice? Right? I think we're doing it now. I think this is what we do. This is how we change the culture. You have the conversation. I'm curious about, uh, you talked about a lot of the difficulties of being a parent, but what about um, if you are a business and you're thinking about who to hire, I guess, how would you articulate the positives of hiring people who are parents or who are going to be parents? Like, what are the upsides of that? And so I, I can maybe briefly answer. Um, I, I think it comes to loyalty. I, I, my dad is a very successful entrepreneur. It's where probably where my bug comes from. Um, and you know, with offices around the world and, you know, a healthy level of employees. And he's had employees with him that have been there 20, 30, even into 40 years of employment. And he has always treated them as a greater extended family. And he's not Apple or one of those, but, you know, we're talking about 150, 200 employees in one location at, at a time. And he's had people pass away during that time. He's had people get married and have children and whatnot. So I, mean, I know we're saying sort of the same thing over and over again, but it is really a top down type of, if the company treats their employees and cares for them as humans and as both, the, the, as we've all said that, you know, it, for them to sit down and ask you a question and, and know where you are in, in your process and what you need. And mind you, the employee has to also give back. It's not a one-way street. It's a two-way. They have to care about you. When I've hired employees, I'm like, look, I'm going to treat you like I would treat anybody else. I expect you to treat me the same. And so if we both do that, then, then there's room for, for growth continually. And to, you know, to your point earlier, I'm not sure where we're all going to shake out, but as women are being propelled and as we are coming together and taking bigger leaps and and supporting one another and taking bigger positions and whatnot and I hope that continues like to have two 
both the husband and the wife coming into leadership positions and continue to grow, someone's going to take the hit. So if a company doesn't step in and help you man your children, that's a whole nother problem that's about to happen. So it is really, really important for whether you're self-employed and you are, and you're working for a small business or you're in a corporation and a leader that's helping to pave that way. You have to support them both because the child will at some point, they're, they're going to take the hit. It's not going to be, it's not going to be the parents. Hi, um, I actually wanted to go back to uh, what you were asking about the um, changing the cultural shift in America around motherhood. And I think a really big part of that is changing this narrative that you're supposed to enjoy every minute of motherhood. Like, <laughs> let's face it, motherhood is hard. <laughs> motherhood is hard. Pumping sucked. Nobody likes being up at 3 a.m. and then at 5 a.m. because your kid is screaming, crying, whatever. Um, I think this idea that, you know, you're supposed to enjoy every minute of motherhood is really damaging and it doesn't really help um, it doesn't really help people see that parents need to be supported in the workplace. So I think if we stopped pretending that it was all happy and wonderful, we need to enjoy it all, all the time, then maybe there would be more of that shift and people would start understanding, you know, that we need that support because it is not beautiful all of the time. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, thank you. Thank you, Thank you, panelists. Thank you so much for hosting this. Um, yeah. And any final words, panel? Um, Stay strong. Don't give up. Yeah. Keep advocating. Keep advocating. Keep advocating. Yeah, I, I'm the same. I yeah. just you got to you got to say what you want and not be afraid of it. If there are consequences, it wasn't the right place for you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> <I did. laughs>